We are ready to begin again, and I'd like to begin this part of the program by thanking the staff and the management and the service workers here at the center for the extraordinary and excellent service and support we've had. Thank you very, very kindly. Our keynote speaker is Ambassador Thomas Graham, Jr. He's one of the world's leading experts on nuclear nonproliferation. Ambassador Graham has served under four successive U.S. presidents and is a senior U.S. diplomat involved in the negotiation of every major international arms control and nonproliferation uh, agreement for the past 35 years. He's currently the executive chairman of Lightbridge Corporation, which is a nuclear energy uh, consulting service that is developing next generation nuclear uh, fuel technology that will significantly reduce nuclear waste and proliferation. Ambassador Graham's keynote address will focus on the current state of nuclear armament throughout the world, the dangers that this poses, and what can be done to promote anti-proliferation. Following the event, uh, Ambassador will be available to uh, sign his book, which is on uh, sale. After the Ambassador's remarks, I'll introduce Professor Michael Fowler, who will respond and comment on the address from Ambassador Graham. So Ambassador Graham, welcome home. Well, it's great to be back here at the Festival of Faiths. This is my third time uh, making a presentation at the Festival of Faiths. Uh, the first time was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, it was a, you can't hear me back there? Well, I guess I'll, how about that? You can hear me now. Okay, and the third, uh, uh, first time was a, a panel of, uh, uh, distinguished clerics. Uh, the last time, most recent time, was a presentation at, in the, inside the uh, cathedral. And here I am again today, and I'm very happy to be here. This, the subject, as uh, was uh, mentioned, is uh, nuclear weapons and the future of civilization, which allows me to talk about just about anything. But in any case, uh, that more or less is what I will attempt to um, communicate and discuss. <clears throat> On August 6th, 1945, it began as a beautiful summer day in Hiroshima, Japan. The director of the Hiroshima Communications Hospital began his diary entry of the morning. This is a quote. The hour was early, the morning still warm and beautiful, shimmering leaves reflecting sunlight from a cloudless sky made a pleasant contrast with shadows in my garden. The atomic bomb exploded at 8.16 a.m. Hiroshima time, 1,900 feet above the courtyard of the Shima Hospital and 515 feet south of the Ioi Bridge nearby. As one crew member on the American plane described it, where we had seen a clear city two minutes ago, two, uh, two minutes before, we could no longer see the city. We could see smoke and fire creeping up the sides of the mountains. In the words of another crew member, the city looked like a pot of boiling black oil. Still another said, the mushroom was a spectacular sight, 
a burbling mass of purple-gray smoke, and you could see it had a red core inside, and everything was burning inside. As a Japanese study explained, it was not only human beings that died in the scores of thousands at Hiroshima. In the case of atomic bombing, an atomic bombing, a community does not merely receive an impact, the community itself is destroyed. Within two kilometers of the atomic bomb's hypocenter, all life and property were shattered, burned, and buried under ashes. The visible forms of the city, where people once carried on their daily lives, vanished without a trace. The atomic bomb had blasted and burned hospitals, schools, city offices, police stations, and every other kind of human organization. The whole of society was laid waste to its foundation. And this was a small atomic bomb. The world changed in 1945 with the advent of the atomic bomb. For the first time, humankind possessed a weapon with which it could destroy itself. Nuclear weapons are unlike any other form of weaponry. The atomic bomb used against Hiroshima was 14 kilotons, or 14,000 tons of TNT explosive equivalent. In a few years, the United States and the Soviet Union were testing nuclear weapons in the megaton range, or million tons of TNT explosive equivalents. Soon a vast nuclear arms race was underway. The Soviet Union built 55,000 nuclear weapons. The United States some 72,000, and at one time had 32,500 in its arsenal. <clears throat> the Soviet Union possessed about 40, 45,000. This effort eventually bankrupted the Soviet Union and cost the United States in excess of $5.5 trillion in 2004 dollars. President John F. Kennedy truly believed that there was a serious risk that nuclear weapons were destined to sweep all over the world. In March of 1963, in response to a reporter's question at a news conference, he said, personally, I am haunted by the feeling that by 1970, there may be 10 nuclear powers instead of four, and by 1975, 15 or 20. I would regard that as the greatest possible danger and hazard, he said. If such anticipation, if, sorry, if such anticipated proliferation of nuclear weapons had in fact happened. With the spread of technology, there could be more than two dozen nuclear weapon states in the world, indeed far more than two dozen, with nuclear weapons integrated into their national arsenals representing an incalculable security threat. Every conflict would run the risk of going nuclear and it would be it would have been, or maybe would be, extremely difficult to keep nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorist organizations. They would be so widespread. Such a development would make today's security situation seem like paradise by comparison. Venezuela and Cuba with nuclear weapons, perhaps Al-Qaeda with access to nuclear weapons. But this has not happened, at least not yet, because of the negotiation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, as it's called, which converted 
which treaty converted the acquisition of nuclear weapons by additional countries from an act of national pride to an act of international outlawry. It changed the norm of human behavior. The NPT was signed in 1968 and entered into force in 1970 and came to be recognized as the principal reason that President Kennedy's darkest fears have not yet been realized. But as I often say in speeches, the success of the NPT to date is no accident. The treaty was based on a carefully crafted central bargain in exchange for a commitment from the non-nuclear weapon states, that's today more than 180 countries, most of the world, not to acquire nuclear weapons and to submit to international safeguards to verify compliance with this commitment, the nuclear weapon states, which are recognized by the NPT in 1968, that is the United States, the United Kingdom, France, the Soviet Union, or Russia, and China, in 1968 pledged unfettered access to peaceful nuclear technologies and undertook to engage in nuclear disarmament negotiations aimed at the ultimate uh, elimination of their nuclear arsenals. Most importantly, they pledged to stop testing weapons and negotiate a comprehensive test ban, nuclear test ban treaty. It is this basic bargain that for the last four decades has formed the central underpinnings of the international nonproliferation regime that has kept the nuclear peace. <clears throat> However, few of the disarmament elements of the NPT basic bargain have been actually accomplished 40 years later. Most prominently, the test ban, which has been languishing in the United States Senate for many years after the negative vote in 1999. Now, since the mid 20th century, almost all American presidents have placed arms control and nonproliferation high on their agendas. President Dwight D. Eisenhower considered his failure to have achieved a nuclear test ban to be the greatest disappointment of his presidency. The NPT was signed on President Lyndon Johnson's watch. President Nixon oversaw the negotiation of the SALT I agreements and the beginning of the SALT II treaty process. The SALT II process was continued under President Gerald Ford and concluded under President Clinton's leadership. President Ronald Reagan advocated the abolition of all nuclear weapons and completed the medium range nuclear missile treaty. The most successful arms control president was President George H. W. Bush. His administration concluded four major arms control treaties uh, during his four years as president the START I Treaty, the START II Treaty, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, and the Chemical Weapons Convention. No other president completed more than one. Thus, nuclear arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament negotiations have been at the center of U.S. foreign policy for much of the last 50 years. And no other president has spoken out more eloquently and in such a comprehensive manner <clears throat> than President Barack Obama, who in Prague in April of 2009 declared his support for a replacement START treaty to be followed by deeper cuts in nuclear weapons leading to a multilateral nuclear weapon reduction negotiation involving all of the nuclear weapon states. He reiterated his support for U.S. ratification 
and entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which is, was still held up in the Senate, and he confirmed his own support for a process that would lead to a nuclear weapon free world. Free, uh, nuclear weapon free world. He underscored his commitment to the strengthening of the NPT and in 2010 negotiated the New START Treaty, the first reduction of nuclear weapons negotiated since 1994 which after a very difficult time in the partisan divide in the U.S. Senate entered into force in April 2011. However, the NPT remains in crisis. The NPT, which is our bulwark against the widespread proliferation that President Kennedy so feared. It remains in crisis in, crisis in part because of the essential failure of the disarmament agenda, with many important objectives remaining unachieved, and in part because of the continuing high value, high political value of nuclear weapons, whereby the possession of nuclear weapons is seen as distinguishing, uh, is, is seen as the distinguishing feature separating great powers from other states. As a prime minister of Great Britain said many years ago, nuclear weapons, quote, put us right where we ought to be in the position of a great power, close quote. And that's why countries want them. With the NPT basic bargain remaining, re remaining unrealized after 40 years, States eventually could leave the treaty. North Korea already has de jure. Iran has de facto. Without the NPT, disarmament is nothing. The NPT is threatened from many sides today, but primarily at this time by the nuclear programs in Iran and North Korea. The nuclear programs in these two states threaten to break open the NPT regime in the Middle East and Northeast Asia and thereby unleash the wide-scale nuclear proliferation that President Kennedy so greatly and rightly feared. The NPT is essentially an international strategic political bargain which must be observed. <clears throat> it is not a gift from the non-nuclear weapon states. Few deny that today the treaty is in trouble. The question is how long it can remain viable as a balanced treaty with an important part of its basic bargain unrealized and a significant part unraveling as North Korea and Iran pursue the bomb. Recognizing this vulnerability of the NPT, and with the end of the Cold War accompanied by the potential spread of nuclear weapon technology to failed and failing states and international terrorist organizations, serious, serious efforts for the first time have begun to attempt to move toward the complete elimination of nuclear weapons <clears throat> as called for in the NPT. In January of 2007, an article was published in the Wall Street Journal by George Schultz, William Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, and signed by a number of other former senior officials. The authors contended that reliance on nuclear weapons for deterrence, their only justification, quote, is becoming increasingly hazardous and decreasingly effective. Noting that Ronald Reagan had called for the abolishment of all nuclear weapons, which he considered, quote, totally irrational, totally inhumane, 
good for nothing but killing, possibly destructive of life on Earth and civilization. And that General Secretary Mihail Gorbachev shared this vision, the authors called for reassertion of the world, uh, reassertion of the vision uh, so eloquently ad advocated by President Reagan. They have written many more articles, consulted with governments around the world, and have called for the creation of a joint enterprise of the world's nuclear weapon states to join together to create the conditions to permit the negotiation of the elimination of nuclear weapons. We live in a democratic country, but the American people have almost never held elected representatives to any kind of standard to support nuclear nonproliferation, arms limitation, disarmament, and peace. If anything, it is the op opposite. Waving the bloody shirt is often a formula for getting votes. War, not peace, seems to be more popular until the consequences of war, till the consequences of war become clear. There has never been, since the end of the Cold War, even U.S. Senate and House of Representatives public hearings on what the role of, of, of nuclear weapons con uh, should continue to be in the post-Cold War world. This is avoiding responsibility. In 1999, the U.S. Senate voted down the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and seriously dam damaged the NPT and the cause of peace in the process. According to opinion polls at the time, the American people overwhelmingly opposed what the Senate had done, but only a minority said it would affect their vote for their senator at the next election. This double standard has to end if peace and security are to be obtained, rather than war, nuclear weapons, and insecurity. The public must demand it of their representatives, and that means all of us. This is the festival of faiths, and it should be noted that summons to cast aside weapons and pursue the cause of peace date to ancient times. The prophet Isaiah said that God would wield authority over the actions and, and adjudicate between peoples. These will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into sickles. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. There will be no more training for war. Jesus in the Ser Sermon on the Mount said, happy are the peacemakers, they shall be sons of God. According to the Holy Quran, war is such a disaster that Muslims must use every method in their power to restore peace and normality in the shortest possible period of time. In Surah 4, verse 90, it is said, be at peace with those who approach you with hearts restraining them from fighting you. The Dalai Lama, in his new millennium message, said we must work, we must first work on the total abolition of nuclear weapons and gradually work up to total de demilitarization throughout the world. Mahatma Gandhi noted that it may, however, it may be long before the law of love will be recognized in international affairs. The mechanisms of government stand between and hide the hearts of one people from another. Thomas Merton had his own many comments on this subject. Here is one from his letters. I believe that the only valid thing that can be accomplished in the direction of world peace and unity is the formation of men and women who are able to unite in themselves and experience in their own lives all that is best and most true in the great spiritual traditions. <clears throat> this is a dangerous age. Technologies such as nuclear weapons exist, which can destroy civilization. International terrorism plagues all states. Disorder, chaos, poverty, and disease are on the march. 
The four horsemen of the apocalypse are drawing closer. Leaders of the Christian, Buddhist, Islamic, Jewish, and Hindu faiths and others must set an example and put aside their differences as their faiths at their essence truly demand and unite in a search of peace, tolerance, and disarmament. Now more than ever in history, it is imperative that all of us must join in this most serious task. If there is a lesson history can teach us here, <clears throat> it is that nothing that is good should be thought of as impossible. Here at home, the polarized political situation in the United States, even after the election, remains a serious obstacle to process, progress, and much time has passed. Great damage to the disarmament process has been sustained, and the nuclear proliferation crisis seems to grow steadily more dangerous. However, while the hour is growing late, it is not too late. Success remains possible. That safer and more secure world that all of us want can still be built. We must not give up. In the true sense, we must all keep our faith and the faith. And to paraphrase a famous British statesman, never, never, never give in. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Graham, for your remarks, and thank you more for your life's work. I'm pleased to introduce next Professor Michael Fowler of the Department of Political Science at the University of Louisville. Welcome. Professor Fowler is a graduate of Dartmouth College, the University of Virginia, and Harvard Law School. He's a two-time Fulbright Scholar to Japan. He teaches international law, international organization, and conflict resolution. And like Ambassador Graham, he has a brand new book. This one just published by Penn State Press, and it is entitled Bribes, Bullets, and Intimidation drug trafficking and the law in Central America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fowler. Thank you. I am honored to be here uh, sharing a lectern with Ambassador Tom Graham and offering a few of my own thoughts in response to his on the subject of nuclear war. In my time today, I want to focus on what's perhaps a deceptively simple sounding question that Tom introduced us to. Why exactly do we fear nuclear war? In the first instance, of course, we fear nuclear conflicts because of the sheer numbers of likely deaths, the enormity of the immediate and the lasting damage that another nuclear explosion would bring about. A different approach to this issue, however, would focus on what could conceivably cause people to unleash nuclear arms. My thesis then, we fear nuclear weapons in part because of the extent of the destruction should they be utilized, and in part because the chances that these arms might actually be used again is not so minimal as we would like. Now, we students of international relations, whether political scientists or historians or philosophers, often cite a handful of key motives or causes for war. Let me run through some of these next 
uh, while spite spotlighting the particular context of a possible nuclear conflict. A first and long-standing idea is that strong passions lead to armed conflict, armed conflict of different varieties. In effect, leaders lose their cool. It is uncontrolled emotions, uh, maybe fueled by nationalism or ancient, ancient hatreds, uh, a desire for revenge, that that is what often brings on war. Uh, for instance, one theory holds that the Balkans have long been an international hotspot since well before World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, uh, precisely because of all of the deep-rooted feuds that have plagued that region. Now, as we appraise potential nuclear hotspots, that same possible motive arises again. Uh, some look at the uneasy nuclear standoff between India and Pakistan and shudder at the possibility that a nationalist or a religious clash might someday bring one to seriously contemplate a nuclear exchange, particularly, I think, should extremists gain control in Islamabad. Or we consider the so-called rogue states that Ambassador Graham mentioned. Right, led by governments with leaders whose judgment may seem bizarre to us. Our fear here is that the leadership of a state like North Korea might irrationally use nuclear arms, or maybe even more likely, choose to sell nuclear weapons or materials, perhaps to a terrorist group. And terrorist organizations themselves often motivated by religious or ethnic hatred. Hatred that might, in their eyes, uh, justify exploding a nuclear device against their enemies. This could be as simple as a dirty bomb, an, an ordinary explosive supercharged with some radioactive substance. That kind of easily mixed cocktail uh, could create a, a psychologically damaging explosion, though one with, with limited destructive power, perhaps. A second idea is, uh, again, in general, war is most often caused by ignorance or by grave misunderstandings. Leaders are prone to jump to conclusions, too often the wrong ones and embark on armed conflict because of erroneous beliefs. The example springing to many of your minds might be the George W. Bush administration and its false expectation of finding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But that's really just one instance. In many other cases, foreign policymakers have wrongly assumed something that led them on to war. Indeed, the Moscow to Washington hotline established after the Cuban Missile Crisis was an effort to enable the superpower leaders to overcome potential misunderstandings by direct communication in moments of extraordinary tension. Then, the post-Cold War opening of communist archives has revealed that in the run-up to the Missile Crisis, Fidel Castro sent a letter to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev arguing that the Soviet Union should consider initiating a nuclear conflict against the United States. Khrushchev met with top Soviet and Czech officials to discuss this. Quote, we were completely aghast, Khrushchev declared. Castro clearly has no idea what thermonuclear war is. And the Soviet leader went on, it is clear that with a first strike, one cannot today knock the opponent out of the fight. There can always be a counter strike. There are, after all, missiles in the earth, which intelligence does not know about. There are missiles on submarines. What would we gain if we ourselves started a war? After all, millions of our people would die in our country, too. Can we even contemplate a thing like that? 
an example of, of rank ignorance of nuclear war on Castro's part at that time, and a complete misunderstanding of its likely consequences. Over on the other side of the missile crisis, the XCOM, right, that group of senior foreign policy makers advising President Kennedy, uh, seriously considered a quote unquote surgical strike on the Soviet missile sites. And we now know this might have been disastrous since the Soviets had already gotten about 150 short range nuclear missile sites operational with Soviet officers ordered fire if the United States invades. We've also recently learned that early in the Reagan years, Soviet intelligence concluded erroneously that the US government was intending to launch a first strike with nuclear weapons. An immensely dangerous misassumption. Even more recently, in response to a threatened air assault on its nuclear facilities, the North Korean government issued the counter threat that it would then turn Seoul, South Korea, into a sea of fire. The North Koreans there highlighting the fear that a military assault might miss some nuclear weapons, which might then be launched against the attacker with catastrophic results. Might a nuclear conflict be initiated then by a preemptive conventional military strike gone awry, one that aimed to eliminate all of an opponent's nuclear capabilities, but that miscalculated, that overlooked some? Now, if passions or ignorance or miscalculations, if they don't bring on war, even nuclear war, some have worried that selfish, cynical, enormously irresponsible, or downright evil people might manage to do so. In past eras, analysts of the causes of war have pointed to, to the pernicious effects of mercenaries, weapons manufacturers, dictators, warmongering leaders of various types. And here in the nuclear con context, you might think of Dr. A.Q. Khan, father of the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, later found to be leading a network supplying nuclear weapons technology to Libya, Iran, North Korea. A fourth theoretical motive for uh, wars of different types is thought to be national pride, national honor of governments. And at first glance, one might be inclined to dismiss considerations of national honor as a factor perhaps that swayed the minds of maybe 19th century leaders. But while many people do not talk of honor so openly or frequently anymore, maybe still a factor worth our reckoning with. Think of the influence of national honor on the Falkland Islands conflict between Argentina and Great Britain in the early 1980s, or the US attack on Cambodia after seizure of the US ship Mayaguez in the Ford years. Wounded national honor might have played into some more recent wars, too. I'll leave that for you all to ponder. Our Festival of Face context brings me to one other related point that one often hears concerning the causes of war. With respect to international disputes, instead of moderate discussion leading to a reasonable resolution, pride, pride, which various religions point to as a, a constant flaw of human beings, pride, we're told, can lead to war. In the nuclear field, the particular difficulty is that leaders and their publics have sometimes been inclined to view nuclear weapons as symbols of great power. And with some reason, perhaps. Uh, after all, the five primary nuclear weapon states, perhaps no, not so coincidentally, also the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Now, uh, for many years, 
as Ambassador Graham noted, people have put their faith in the basic bargain underlying the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that arms reductions by the nuclear weapon states, and also their cooperation in spreading nuclear technology for peaceful energy purposes would keep other states from pursuing nuclear weapons technology. Today, it's at least questionable whether Iran and various other states buy into that basic bargain. My point, national pride, the perception that their prestige, their clout in the international scene might be enhanced, that might impel more countries toward trying to gain nuclear arms. And that fear leads directly to my next point. I would label a fifth purported cause of war the tinderbox approach, that violent conflicts are, are generally caused by the presence of large numbers of weapons. Arms get manufactured, and then they're just lying around waiting to be used. In the nuclear field, this has been behind the effort to control the so-called loose nukes. One former Soviet official has reported during the Cold War, the Soviet Union manufactured 45,000 nuclear arms, had stockpiles of materials sufficient to make maybe another 90,000. Just how much of this has been secured or destroyed remains very much an open question. And the great fear is that these leftover nuclear materials might fall into the wrong hands. Nuclear arsenals that are not well secured, whether they're in modern day Russia or Pakistan or some other country, and that might be vulnerable to an assault by criminals or by terrorists. That's the modern day nuclear variant on the longstanding tinderbox theory. An arms bazaar of nuclear weapons and materials. There's another source of the fear that a nuclear explosion is perhaps not so far-fetched. In uh, closing, yet another cause of war, including nuclear war, that we need to reckon with, is the idea that a government might just view such a conflict as serving national interests. Recall, in World War II, confronting the prospect of a ground invasion of Japan, which some suggested might bring on millions of casualties among allied soldiers, Japanese soldiers, civilians. The Truman administration opted to try to win the war quickly with atomic weapons. At other times in American history, uh, nuclear arms have been readied for use and then served as leverage of some kind in an ongoing negotiation. For instance, in the Berlin crisis of 1948, the Truman administration sent a number of B-29 bombers specially designed to hold nuclear weapons to London for a possible strike at the Soviet Union. Then when President Eisenhower entered office, surveyed the long stalemated war in Korea, he sent a message to Indian leader Nehru to tell the Soviets that continuing American casualties were unacceptable, that the US was prepared to use nuclear weapons to end the conflict if further negotiations stalled. So perhaps we should fear nuclear war since past leaders, even prior American officials, have seen their country's national interests as served by the use or the threatened use of nuclear arms. Those two examples, of course, come from the Cold War, but they may still underscore a key fear today that some future leaders of the 70 plus states quite capable of building nuclear arms, but that to date uh, have, have signed and abided by the NPT, will opt to construct such weapons. 
they may come to believe that the presence of nuclear weapons will enhance their security, either to use them as a shield against a conventional military assault or to deter potential attacks by a nuclear weapons state. Of course, such a train of thought may well be completely mistaken. The dangers to a country's national security might actually increase should it acquire a limited number of nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, one can certainly imagine the military and the political apparatus of a state finding national security arguments of this type persuasive. That variety of threat to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that's sobering, frightening even for many. I have laid out a half dozen commonly cited causes of war, each of which I think has a nuclear war analog. I still may not have identified the most troubling reason that I think we fear nuclear war, which I'll approach by analogy. In, in daily life, murder is not always a matter that can be logically explained. And our, our serial killers, people who repeatedly murder without apparent motive or compunction, they perhaps elicit our worst nightmares. Similarly, as one scholar put it, War might also be attributed to, quote, eruptions of deep-seated malignancy of the human situation, outcroppings of forces, manifestations of drives, and symptoms of irrationalities of power politics that lie essentially beyond the range of Pacific settlement. I'd suggest that this may really be what most concerns us about the prospect of nuclear conflict. Just as we still don't fully understand where various cancers come from, so we still don't fully understand what drives people to make decisions in international relations, particularly in times of crisis. We especially fear the unknown. We're really most concerned that one dark day, the irrationality that's a part of the human condition, both individuals and groups, that might just seize control and bring on nuclear conflict. Why don't I stop there? And perhaps we have a bit of time for discussion.